All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Rich Vandenberg with the New York State Brewers Association, and I've been asked to moderate today's presentation. Today we have Matt Kahn. Matt is from Big Ditch Brewing, and he has his BS in Chemical Engineering from the University of Buffalo, and his MS in Chemical Engineering from Cornell University. So it seems as though he knows what he's talking about. Prior to opening a brewery, uh, Matt worked for 15 years in uh, consumer products, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. He opened his brewery, Brick Ditch Company, in 2014, and I've been there, it's an amazing place, uh, and has since helped to grow it into one of New York State's largest, most recognized craft breweries. So please join me in welcoming Matt. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, great. So I'm going to talk today about brewery yield improvements, or... Uh, you know, the long-form version, systematic method to reduce cost and increase productivity and capacity, but brewery yield improvements. Um, before I start, just some things, I, I made some notes today, just like I thought about this topic even a little bit as I went through other presentations today. Um, so just a few things. A lot, there's a lot of talented brewers in New York State, so actually a lot of this might be obvious to many of you guys already. I could say going through this, this a lot of this wasn't obvious to us. So hopefully maybe you learn a few things, but maybe some things you already know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, this presentation isn't it, like require a lot of special equipment or ingredients, so you don't need a centrifuge for this. I'll touch on that a little bit, or like special hot products. This is about taking the resources you already have um, and just making more good beer. Likewise, um, this is not a talk about making your beer cheaper. It's not about making cheap beer. I mean, you can just stop dry hopping your IPAs. You'll get better yield out of them. Um, that's not what we're trying to do here. It's just making you know more good beer um, with your existing resources. Um, and finally, like I was thinking about sustainability, which is really the topic of this you know th this conference. And you know, I didn't really put together why maybe they had me do this talk here. But you know, we're really talking about making more beer again with existing resources, um, less waste more beer, right? So this will actually make your brewery more sustainable because hopefully you're throwing less beer away. Um, at least it did for us. So with that, let me get started. Um, so just agenda, what we're going to talk about, a um, little intro, background about uh, Big Ditch a little bit, and the beers we make. Um, the importance of yield, if it's not obvious to you why that might be important, a little, a little bit of math, not that much, just a little bit. Um, and then I'll take you through a case study of our beer and show you some data about you know, how we made beer and some of the improvements we made. Analysis, a lot of words there, a couple pictures, videos. Um, you know, just stop me if it doesn't make sense or have any questions. Um, best practices that we came up with in final sort of a data review, what we did, and then we'll sum it all up. Okay, so let's get going. So Big Ditch Brewing, for those who are um, familiar, um, we opened in 2014. Um, our original brewery is on Huron Street, it's right downtown, right downtown Buffalo on a street called Huron Street. Um, we were lucky enough to open with a 20 barrel, two vessel system. We ran on that until 2022. Our, uh, our best selling beer is a beer called Hayburner. It's our flagship American IPA. It's a lot of what we make, 70 to 75% of what we make. So we're ma making a lot of one beer. This presentation is mostly about that one beer, but you can still use it for all sorts of different things. Um, and then one of the key important parts of this is that we were operating at like 90 to 99% capacity for several years. Um, we were running a three shift operation. Um, everything that we could make, we were selling for a period of time. So it became really critical for us if we wanted to, and not just like sell as much as possible, not disappoint customers. I mean, there were customers that were depending on our beer to be on the shelf. Um, you know, we were trying to make as much as possible. So focusing on yield became very important for maximizing our capacity. Um, and then we, you know, the story goes this summer, we actually were able to open a 40 barrel two vessel system. Um, so that gave us a little more room finally after sort of running really tight for several years. But the same principles applied and I'll show you some data from the new brewery too. Um, so quick more background pictures. So our 20 barrel brewery in Huron Street, the original one, you can see it just packed with crap. Uh, maybe your brewery looks like this. It was just, there was barely room to move around or walk anywhere. Um, it wasn't always like that, but really became like that. Um, then you can see the new brewery, a lot more space, a little more open. Um, maybe one day it'll get filled up as like, like her on street, but uh, a little bit of, you know, sort of what the breweries look like there. Um, and then, so why is this important? Um, and again, maybe obvious to you, but I'll just describe it just in case it isn't. And some of the things that it could do for your, uh, for your brewery. Um, again, I'll keep stating this. This is after quality. 
no one wants you to make your beer worse. Keep making more good beer. Um, but you know, once you've got your beer tasting good, how do you make as much as possible uh, with every batch? So some quick math here, and if you went to the cost of goods presentation earlier today, there's a little bit of review on this. Um, but you know, if you improve your yield, you're going to improve your cost of goods. So what's cost of goods? Um, very simply, take all the material costs to make your beer, just the liquid itself, divide that by the yields, and then add in your packaging material costs, and that's sort of your direct variable cost of goods, all the materials that go into making your beer. So let's do a quick example, very simple math. Um, let's say the batch takes $2,000 to make a batch, and your packaging costs with the cans and the pack tax and the trays, labels, let's say, 10 bucks a case. Um, but you have two different scenarios. In one case, you do 150 cases, and in another, you do 200, okay, as so you've increased your yield by 50 cases. And you sell it maybe at 16 bucks a four pack. So in the one case, you take the 2,000 over 150 plus 10, your, your cost of goods are 23.33 a case. And if you look at your gross profit, what you sold it for minus what it cost you, you've earned almost $11,000, $10,900. Um, let's say you can get 50 more cases out of that same batch. Um, now your cost is $20 a case. You have 200 more case, 50 more cases to sell, 200 cases. Now you've made $15,200. So, you know, quick math, you know, $3,300, $3, right? Um, 4300 So that's 40% increase in your, um, in your income right there. Um, and all you've done is really become more efficient. Not super easy to do, but, you know, that's kind of why you're looking at that. So that's, you know, the financial sort of goals there. Um, but other things this will do for you as well, too. So you could definitely take that money and pocket it and reinvest it and use it for all sorts of other things. Maybe you don't want to do that. Um, nowadays, you know, beer is, um, or is a little bit of a, a premium, right? People go to the grocery stores, things are very expensive, and they have to make choices about what to buy. Um, and maybe you want to take that money and say, I can reduce my pricing a little bit. It's all about, you know, getting that gross profit as high as possible, right? So if you take the pricing down, but you sell more, you're still sort of earning more, right? So you could also look at your pricing. I could say we've done that in other products as well, try to get our pricing a little bit better um, with the extra money we saved. Um, obviously maximizing capacity, I talked about that a little bit. And then finally, making your overhead more efficient, labor, rents. Um, you know, think about it like this, the more you yield out of every batch, the less batches you have to make, right? So less time actually making, you know, making that batch of beer is maybe more time for recipe development, or maybe it's more time for maintenance, or maybe finally, you know, you can finally get that day off you've been wanting for so long because you don't have to make that extra batch of beer. Something like that. Um, but a little less time spent processing, more time for other useful things. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about here as well. All right, so now let's talk about hay burner. So again, our, our 70 to 75% of what we make, um, little stats on it, 7.2%, um, OG is 15 and a half degrees Play-Doh. We dry up hay burner about two pounds per barrel, so not super duper high, okay? Just a moderate dry hop. Um, it's... Total dry hop or...? Total. Total dry hop. Hot and full side. Uh, hot, like not counting kettle or whirlpool hops, just dry hop. Yeah. Yep, yep, sorry. Um, it's unfiltered as well. Um, and then often we would double or triple batch batches of hay burner into a, a 40 barrel or 60 barrel fermenter, okay? That's hay burner. Okay, so now comes the data and some charts. So um, what I'm showing you here is, you know, from a typical 20 barrel batch, how much would we actually package? Um, this is back in 2015. This is even before we were canning it, so this is just from kegs. And what you can see here is we were getting like a little less than 17 barrels out of a 20 barrel batch. So that's about 85% yield, right? Um, probably pretty typical for, for dry hot batches, maybe. Um, again, very early on, we weren't totally unhappy with this, but you know, it, it was what it was. Um, we actually transitioned to cans right after this, so we went from kegs to cans. And actually, I was surprised at this data. We didn't lose that much yield, actually, we're doing a good job with canning, getting about 17 barrels canned for 20 barrel batch. But, you know, as we continued to grow and things got a little tighter, 
you know, we started looking and say, well, we brewed like 64 batches of Hayburn in 2016. If we could get three barrels of every batch out, we'd save almost 10 full batches of beer. Um, so really started looking at this more in detail. Um, one thing that was surprising me as I was looking through this data set is it took us, like from the beginning of this to the end, it's like four and a half years. So there, it's, it's a very long, painstaking process. The more time you put into it, the faster you might get improvements. Um, but just letting you know, it, it, it takes time to get this done. Um, and again, I'll state, you know, do not damage the quality of the beer. We were never using inferior ingredients or, you know, just reducing that dry hop or looking for like the most efficient malt or, or something like that. We we're just trying to take what we had and make it better. Um, I'm assuming that pertains to a lot of folks here as well. Okay, so improvement process. So this is sort of the process that we actually used as we went through this. Um, so with my you know, background, I was lucky enough to work at a few bigger companies that gave me some of the training to you know, open this relatively small company. Um, so you know, I had some training and things like focused improvement or analytical troubleshooting, a little bit of Six Sigma. I don't know how much many people have been exposed to that. I just um, got PTSD with my, uh, my operational management class. You know. You're taking it right now. Cool. Uh, cool. No, it's back in college. Back in college. Yellow belt? I have a green belt. Green. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. But I don't have a black belt. I probably never will. But um, so th there's a lot that goes into that. It's very in depth. But this is a, actually a very easy, useful tool that you can use on anything. So the abbreviation is called the MAIC. And just for any complex problem, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. So first, define what your problem is, what's your goal. And then measure lots and lots of data around your goal. Um, and then analyze that data to try to figure out where the problems are. Um, make your improvements and check to see if they're working. And finally, and I'm going to emphasize this at the end, your control step, which a lot of people forget. But make sure you put your um, processes in place, let's say they're procedures or maintenance or inspections, things like that. Um, or training, obviously, to make sure that you don't, you don't walk away from it and three months later you're back to where you came from. So you need to do a control step in this. So DMAIC. Keep going. So I already sort of defined the problem, so I'll talk about measurement. And again, I said this approach works best for a single recipe, so you know, you're getting the same inputs every time. It's the same grain bill, the same hop load, that sort of thing. But again, you'll find that this method will help all of your beers, actually. Um, so beers, even though we don't dry hop, we get very, very, very good yields. Um, but it starts with really measuring lots of data. So we're going out and measuring what's our pre-boil volume, what's our post-boil volume, knockout volume, transfer to bright, if you have a bright tank, um, what's your package volume, and just consistently recording all this data. And even looking at other variables. So who was the operator? Who was the brewer that day? Who did the transfer? Who was running the packaging line? Um, was a number of turns, so was it a single batch, two batches, three batches, that sort of thing, um, in one tank, did that affect things? Um, how long did that beer sit in the tank for? So, like, if it was cold crash for a day, do you get worse yield than if it was cold crash for a week or something like that? These are all things you just kind of want to measure to see what impacts your process. Um, and so this is sort of what it looks like. Don't try to read that. You don't need to read that. Um, but like, it's a huge pile of data, right? But just lots of lots of numbers. Um, but you just kind of want to start measuring lots of data so you can later analyze it. All right. Um, and then, so then, once you have all this data, it's the analysis. And really, what we're trying to do, and this is kind of where I started from, is it's really determining where the losses were coming from. So we're looking at, let's say, the volume we have in the kettle and the volume we have after boil, and then the volume we have for knockout, and that sort of thing. So looking at every step, mashing, watering, boiling, whirlpool, fermentation, your transfer to bright if you've got a bright tank, um, and then packaging. Every one of these steps is a place you can have some loss. So trying to, again, analyze that data, figure out where do you have the most loss, what do you want to go work on. And so as I get into it, um, I'm going to sort of like, again, it took years to collect all this, so it's sort of like a summary of all the little learnings we had. Again, some, some of these things I'm sure you know, others maybe not as obvious. Is there a question? I thought I had a question. Okay. Uh, I have one from just a little while back. But you guys were trying to uh, maximize productivity for this 40 barrel brew house. Why'd you have to go with a two barrel? Or a two, a two best? Sorry. Good, good question. It's a complicated um, answer, but it was basically like, 
the number of shifts versus the amount of beer we needed to make. Like we didn't need to do, um, well, and again, space limitations, things like cap capital costs, all of that went into it. So I'm not to say that the two vessel system is the most um, efficient that way. Um, we probably could have gotten some other choices. So there's a lot, a lot that went into that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really answer your question, but it's okay. that, that's the answer. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so start with just mashing. So um, again, this is sort of like the easiest way, and this is really like milling, but this is really the easiest way to get more yield from your grain bill. It's just take a look at your mill gap, and a lot of times, you know, it could be a little bit tighter. Um, so, you know, we'd start with the mill gap, getting a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter. Um, and we found usually that resulted in a better mash efficiency. Um, you can't go too tight, otherwise you're going to plug up your screen, and we definitely saw that. So, I mean, if we got too tight, we would have lots of problems laudering. So there's a balance there. Um, you can use, if you have a set of sieves, which only cost a couple hundred bucks, you can sort of optimize for, you know, how tight you can go versus how good your lauder efficiency was. But it's something that, if you're thinking you can get a little more out of it, try going a little tighter with your mill, and you might be able to be surprised, you know, what you can get out of it. Um, so yeah, and that again, depends on your mill, your screen construction, this assumes you like, cannot change your screen um, that you've got for your lauder tank, but um, you know, this is the, the first place we go to try to get a, you know, try to improve our yields. Um, I was gonna say too, I talked about control, and again, I'll talk about it at the end, but the mill gap is one of these things you need to be checking frequently. So if you don't like measure it frequently, I think we probably check it once a month maybe, right? Um, once a month we're going and checking it because you know that thing shakes like crazy a lot of stuff's going in and out of it it's, it's, It vibrates it will get loose and move around on you and you'll lose a little efficiency So you know once a month ish on our frequency we're going checking it and occasionally need some adjustment So make sure you're doing that um, Obviously make sure your grain is properly hydrated for optimal extraction. We didn't see a lot of variation if we went a little too high with the water versus the grain um, but we definitely saw a point where you can get too low and the grain's not really hydrated real well. You're not going to get good extraction. So definitely um, check that. Make sure you're getting, you know, good water to grain ratio. Um, and finally, like, and I'm going to come back to this again as well, but are your vessels full? So it's sort of like if your gap is good and you're getting good efficiency out of your grain um, and your tanks just have a lot of space in them, maybe you just need to add a little more. Um, and actually, that's like you might sort of argue, well, how did that really help me? I just put more ingredients into my beer. But, um, you know, if you look at it again, you're saving time. You're getting more out of every batch, right? So overall, that's going to be a savings. So we had to do a few times. We had to go back and just change the recipe a little bit mm -hmm. to get more out of it. Um, Laudering, again, these are a lot of words here. It's hard to show some of the stuff, but I'll, I'll try to mix in some pictures. Um, Lauder rates, that's another thing we want to really be careful about um, tracking. So this is a trade up between speed and efficiency. You can lauder really fast and move it all through, but you won't be as efficient, or you can go really slow, but then you're going to limit the amount of beer you can actually get done in a day. So um, we found generally if you lauder a little slower, you'll get better efficiency out of that lauder, um, but don't go too slow. Um, the important thing is there to measure it. So, you know, if you've got a sight glass on your kettle or any sort of marking for your kettle and you've got a stopwatch, you know, that's one way to measure it. You can keep doing that and making sure that it's sort of staying within the right range. Um, but if you're not measuring it and then you're not really controlling it, then, you know, you're probably going to be a little bit inefficient. Um, we actually found for our process that the lauder was about three hours. I think, I think sometimes, you know, depending on your system, it could be a little longer. It depends on your... 20, right? 20, yep, 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 <laughs> yep, yep, no problem. Um, that, that was ideal for our process. There's ways to probably improve that a little bit, but that sort of maximized efficiency versus the number of like brews we could get done in a, in a day or in a week. Um, and finally, definitely make sure you're measuring your pre-boil volume um, so you've got that data point. What, you know, out of that whole thing, how much did you lot her over? Um, and you want to, you know, get that as high as possible. Um, so there's just a quick little picture of our setup. This is at the new brewery actually. You've got a little flow meter coming out of the lauder pump. And then this newer system is nice actually where we've got control so we can just type in what we're targeting for the lauder and then the pump will ramp up and ramp down to hit that lauder rate. We didn't have that at the Huron Street Brewery. Yeah. We sort of like would set the dial to a certain number. 
But then after a while, we started measuring it and realizing, well, that changes over time, so we would adjust it and play with it a little bit. Um, this way is obviously ideal, but you don't need to do that to still gain, you know, gain some of these efficiencies. Next, so then boiling. Um, so again, is the kettle as full as possible? Um, without, obviously, no risk of boil over any safety issues, but you know, if you've got a lot of room in your kettle, um, maybe you could get a little more in there, just again, by um, you know, just bumping up the grain you're using. Um, so it's something we had to look at over and over again. Um, I would say we'd also recommend you get a vigorous boil during your boil. Um, we didn't always do it that way, but we found that when we get a nice vigorous boil, we get better hot break, and then you get better tube separation during your whirlpool. Um, when we had a weak boil, we had a, really had a tough time separating like, the solids and the liquids, and we would just lose a lot of beer in the kettle, wort in the kettle. Um, so better hot break um, yields, gets a little bit better efficiency. Um, clean kettles are important, so if you're not you know, somewhat frequently cleaning your kettles, you're gonna have a problem with heat transfer maybe a little bit. Um, so make sure you're looking at that. Um, would occasionally pop up with us. Um, make sure your boiler steam pressure is optimized. So if you're like not getting enough, and again, this assumes a boiler, so you might have an electric system, that sort of thing. Um, but just make sure you're getting enough energy to get your boil, you know, where it needs to be. If not, you maybe want to think about upgrading that, something to get a little more energy into that boil. Um, and another thing that kind of snagged us at some point in the middle of this was even our treatment for our boiler. Um, so we like weren't doing a real good job with like our chemical treatment of our boiler water. And then we started getting like crap from inside the system plugging up our traps. So we weren't getting like good steam moving through the boil, weren't getting a good boil. So it's something that you probably want to look at as well too if you're not managing like your boiler water chemistry, have somebody come in and do that. Um, it's pretty typical, again, something we didn't know for the first several years. Um, we didn't do well, but um, something that definitely is going to bit us somewhere in the middle of this is something you can look at. Um, so here's a picture of, again, our newer brewery system. This kettle actually is not, I would say, that full. We probably have about 18 inches from the top of it to the, um, where the liquid is. We probably could put a little more in here. We didn't in this situation for this brewery because our fermenters are a little volume limiting. So I could put more wort in this kettle, but then our fermenters would be overflowing. So you got to find what the right volume is so it sort of maxes out the, you know, the volume everywhere or optimizes it everywhere. All right, then Whirlpool, something else that we saw. Obviously, you know what this is, separation of your hot break and true and wort, a vortex. Um, you know, from our experience, you want this to be sort of as fast as possible. Our Heron Tree Brewery had like a very small inlet port so we could only get it so fast. Um, we were sort of maxing out how fast we could run the pump to try to get that spinning. Um, but the better you know, spinning you're getting in Vortex, you know, you're getting all that stuff to sort of settle. Um, and then make sure if you're not doing this, and my guess is again, this is fairly intuitive, but maybe not, I don't know. Uh, make sure you're giving it a good rest. So we'll whirlpool for 15 minutes and then rest for 15 minutes. If we're gonna add any hops during that stage. We won't add them before like five minutes left. We let them spin out a little bit and drop out. Um, and we're doing that every time pretty consistently. Um, here is, hopefully this works. Yeah, okay, cool. So that's what our, yeah, that's what our Whirlpool looks like, which I think this is in the new brewery again, way better than what we had um, on the old brewery, on a 40 barrel system. Um, if you have a smaller system, you might be able to get that to move around a little faster with like a paddle or something like that. Um, but you know, you if it's like still looking, you're gonna have a problem with some settling there, so. Okay, um, fermentation volume. So sort of like how full should the fermenter be? Um, and there's a balance here too, I think, that we found. So, you know, if you're not getting any foam out of the fermenter during your fermentation, you might argue, well, like I could maybe put a little more in there. The question is how much? And again, it's a little balance. It might be different in every system. Um, you don't want your beer obviously like overflowing and a bunch of it is coming out, right? You're just wasting beer. So usually where we balance is a day one of fermentation, we just get a little bit of foam and beer coming out. And then after that, it's pretty settled. And that tends to like maximize the volume that we can get in, in, the, uh, in the tanks. Um, we found that um, as we continually, you know, continually increased our volumes and trying to max out what we can get, 
we were you know, starting to get a lot of foam out of the fermenter. And we did try experiment with antifoam. It actually worked pretty well for us. Um, what, not, not super expensive, don't need very much, but just a little bit to keep that foam coming out of the fermenter and keep it in the tank. Um, so it's something you definitely look at if you're trying to maximize your yields out of every batch. Yes, yeah, question. Did that in fermenter? Yes. Yeah. Or is that kettle? You can do it any time. Yeah, yeah. I think we actually do a kettle. Yeah, we, we, we had a kettle. Yeah. Yep, doesn't affect the flavor or even like we were worried about foam retention in the beer didn't you know as long as you're using just a little bit you're you're fine there so definitely something you could look at yep, yep. Um, didn't notice a change of product quality. Um, and finally, let's say you know you're putting more and more beer in this fermenter, and it's again for a beer like ours, a dry hop beer. You know, don't forget to like maybe scale up your dry hopping rate as well. So if you're covering another barrel out of every batch, let's say, well, make sure you up your dry hop as well. At least you're getting the same beer. Um, so that's something we we're continually doing too, is assessing the recipe, adjusting a little bit every time we made an improvement. Um, and again, there's things I'm not touching on here too much that obviously will help. These are you know products. Cryo hops, you know, concentrated hop extracts, things like that. Um, those things will all improve Im improve your yield. Um, you know, there's cost trade-off as well with those products as well too. So I'm not going to get into that too much here. Um, but certainly, there's other benefits to be had with other types of products. Um, I thought there's actually a pretty cool video. So we got a little sight glass on this is our 80 barrel fermenter. And I was like, let me see how high this thing is actually. It's funny, like our head brewer, Corey, was sort of like, I never actually looked at this, even though he's been brewing beer for eight years. But um, this is actually during fermentation, a hay burner. And I'd say we're about maybe six inches or so from the top of that sight glass. So we're really pretty tight up to the top of that tank. This is day two. So I think this is maybe close to maybe what you want. Um, I, I was pretty happy with it. Um, again, lots of words here. Again, nothing. Two, not obvious here, but um, your transfer technique, again, something that we've had to experiment with and try to perfect and train for all of our brewers. Um, but, you know, start by dumping as much green beer as possible off your tank bottom before starting the transfer. And then if you've got a racking arm, we try to get it just as far down as possible. Sort of like if it's, if it's, not, if it's beer you can't save, then don't keep it in the tank. You know, get it out of there and try to get that racking arm sort of as low as possible so you're just transferring beer. Um, if you do have a centrifuge, you can feed a little bit of those bottoms into your stream, and that's where the value of a centrifuge comes in a little bit. You can save a little bit of beer that way, um, but certainly not necessary um, for your process to really maximize output. Um, and finally, rests for dry hop beers. So um, again, something we had to sort of fine tune and get exactly the way we wanted it to. But you know, you want those hops to settle and compact along the bottom of the fermenter so they're not mixing up with your beer and making the beer unusable. So what we found is to optimize for us, we'll cold crash, we'll wait 24 hours approximately a day at that crash temperature, and then we'll transfer. Um, if we didn't wait 24 hours, we would see a little bit of reduction in yield transferred. If we waited more than 24 hours, we didn't see that much of improvement, so that was kind of like perfect for us. Um, and just optimizes those tank turns versus the yield per batch. Um, and then again, be sure to measure your bright tank volume so you know how much you actually transfer it over. How am I doing on time? I no I'm good? Okay, good. Um, packaging. Um, so this is like its own analysis. We could probably do a whole presentation just on optimizing your packaging process. So I'm not going to go into that in too much detail. Um, but a couple things like on fill volumes. This is stuff we learned like even just over the last year. Um, to my knowledge, and someone could correct me if I, they think there's something else, but I don't think TTB actually regulates fill volumes for malt beverages. They do have regulations for wine and spirits, um, which is, let's say, for a 12-ounce can, about 10.65 mLs. Not actually directly related to us, but if you're looking for a reference there. Um, we sort of take a look at the National Institute of Standards Technology, or NIST, which has maximum level variation for certain package sizes. Um, and they say basically for like a 12 ounce to a 16 ounce can should be about half an, half an ounce, uh, which is 14.8 mLs there. Um, we actually set the specifications for our filler. So we go plus or minus 10 mLs. The tighter you can make that tolerance, the more you're probably going to keep, right? It's going to be exactly where you want. Again, that's a whole different talk. Um, so you sort of have to, you know, maximize that. We do plus or minus 10 mLs on our cans and that, um, that pretty much gets us there. 
Finally, downtime. So, um, unless you have a filler that is like a counter pressure, uh, maybe rotary machine, which we don't have, um, you might see that when your canning line goes down, you get lots of foaming in the cans. These are low fills, right? Um, so we've also had to work really hard to try to just keep the line running. I'm sure everybody is familiar with that. Um, you know, obviously in a safe way, but if you're thinking about how to do that, think about making a list of all of the causes of your downtime. So is it due to like lid jams or are the cans tipping over somewhere or I don't know, it could be for a number of different reasons, but um, you know, maybe your line's running too fast and just things are falling over, slow things down a little bit to get it consistent. Um, and those things will keep you know, your downtime events from happening and probably reduce your scrap. So we know we have a good day when like, the line doesn't stop. I'm sure that's pretty obvious to you guys, but, uh, but you know, that, it doesn't just equate to like, sort of not as much stress and, and time spent, it also is yield. Um, and so if you're gonna try to optimize your yield, you wanna try to eliminate those sorts of downtime. So I kind of touched on this already, but sort of like what was the process here? Um, so we'd make an improvement to one of these things I just touched on. Um, then evaluate like where our volumes were and then, you know, adjust the recipe if needed and then, you know, go from there. And then we'd make another one and so on and so forth. So, you know, over the course of time, constantly sort of reevaluating a recipe, again, with the same quality always in mind, trying to make the beer exactly the same way just trying to get a little more out of it step by step. Um, and so, is the next thing the data? Yeah, okay. So this again is like, the first data I showed you was in 2015, this is up until March of 2020 actually, but um, you know, we, we get it from what started as like 17 barrels out of a batch to you know, a little over 20 out of a 20 barrel batch for um, you know, a dry hop beer. Uh, and that saved us actually in 2020 about 60 batches of beer. So like that's not, Nothing. That's you know that 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 that's that's pretty good. It's a lot of time spent saved. Um, on our forty barrel process, which again is a little newer, we started. So this is you know the amount of can yield we get out of a forty barrel batch. So we had already learned a lot from the other system when we moved to this new brewery. So we started a little bit higher, but still had some room to improve. We had to get everything set optimized. We're still in the middle of that. Like this is very very new data, and we've just sort of got there recently. But, you know, starting at about 39 something to, you know, now getting over 40 barrels out of a 40 barrel batch packaged. So again, it should save us about 2,000 barrels maybe in 2023, which is, again, a lot. So, um, you know, there's the savings. Um, finally, control. I touched this at the beginning, but I want to show you an example of how we control. Um, so again, don't forget this step. Don't take all the things you've learned about your process and just sort of say, okay, it's good now, and walk away from it. There's things you have to check, train on, and repeat to make sure you don't lose these benefits. So um, one thing that we learned is like you can sort of describe the entire hot side process, mashing, watering, kettle, whirlpool, just with a knockout volume. So if you get the knockout volume right, we kind of knew that we would get a good yield. Um, so what we did was actually we took some of the data when we know things are running well and analyzed it, and sort of put a control chart in place that the brewers, uh, our brewers use. So um, you took that data, sort of had an average of you know, what that knockout volume is, and gave a min and a max, two standard deviations of that data. That will be about 95% of your batches should fall between those two points. So maybe one out of every 20 might be out, but you know, 19 out of 20 should really be in. Um, so we have this chart just right you know, by the brewery. Um, brewers knock out a, a batch of hay burner. They go make a little point in the graph. Everybody sees it, we can talk about it. If it's off a little bit, we can try to figure out how to fix it. Um, so, you know, fairly easy control step to implement um, that's really helpful. And we have seen it go out, and then we got to go back and figure out, well, what's, what's wrong? What do we need to go fix? Uh, anything outside of those control limits or consistently below the, below the mean, or maybe you've got trends where the data is just dropping, dropping, dropping. You know, maybe stop what you're doing, examine, you know, your inputs and figure out what's going on there. So that's it, summary. Um, so hopefully, Again, pretty obvious, but you know, you're the focus to save your brewery time and money. Um, again, my last time I'll say it, don't hurt the quality of your beer. That was never the goal. Um, 
And so, you know, obviously you want to do the same thing. Um, DMAIC, obviously you could probably look that up a little bit if you want to learn more about it. Um, but define, measure, analyze, improve control. And again, you can use that not just in this problem, but on any troublesome problem in your brewery or even your restaurant. I mean, we do this sort of thing sort of all the time. We've got a problem we can't solve. We sort of go back and let's start measuring some data, you know, and figure out how to um, improve it. Um, Analyze of each step. Don't ignore the control step or you'll lose everything. And then just be patient with this. It takes time. Again, years and years of like little small improvements. Um, so just take time with it. But it, you know, eventually if you keep working it, it will pay off. So. How do, how do you chart that data? Like, like as a brewer, I write everything down, right? Mm -hmm. But it never shows what the spreadsheet Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do you populate that information? Yeah. Right, so data is important, only if you can go back to it. Yeah. Um, so like, I don't have necessarily that. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I. Oh, damn it. Yeah, I don't have that answer for every brewery. So it could be in your situation that as the, you know, brewer or head brewer, yeah. maybe that's something that you'll be doing. Maybe you've got somebody yeah. in your. Sign myself up for. <laughs> well, so, so maybe it's something, you'll, or, or maybe there's somebody else that you know works at your brewery that is really good with stuff like that. They've got a little time at the desk. Maybe it's um, you know your, your your brewery owner should be invested in this process too. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. If, if the data is no good, you're not going to get very much out. If you're not very good at recording it. Yeah. If you're not very good at recording it, you won't be able to analyze it real well. And like if you know if. Someone, you know, someone has to pay attention to this. So, um, but you know, who actually takes that data and types it in and does the analysis? I mean, it's a it's a group effort. I I, I probably should have mentioned this, but a project like one of these Demaic Six Sigma projects, it's not something that one person does on their own. This is a group project. So, like that defined step, I really glossed over that a little bit. But the right way to start something like this is like a few of the key stakeholders all sit down and say, what are we trying to accomplish here? So we've got 17 barrels out of every batch, we want to get 20, and who's responsible for what? So you're going to make the beer, and you're going to record the data, and you're going to, you know, whatever it is. Everybody's got a little role in the process, everybody's invested on it. If the project goes well, you should be rewarded for it. So um, so that's kind of how that goes. What about software? Like brewery software? Brewery software, right. Um, so, I mean, yes, like, we did all this pretty manually, um, but if you've got a good brewery program, ERP, um, ECOS, Beer 30, things like that, or should be, I'm pretty sure they're going to have that data in it, in, in, in the software, and you can easily use that to like pull a lot of that data and um, use it. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's still somebody writing it down or typing it in and doing the analysis. So no matter how you do it, it still has the same sort of basic things, you know, record the data and then analyze it. So, uh, what was your uh, percent yield before and after the processing? Um, so, percent yield meeting like, like if you what? Were, if you were 17 barrels out of 20 before, where, and I think you said that's like 85 percent. Like, where did you finish at? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we were getting 20 out of a 20 barrel batch. So, you could call that a hundred, but uh, you know, like I don't really think of it as. Like, it's really just optimizing. This is pretty much as good as we could get it. And we could spend a lot more time trying to crank a little bit more out of it. But, like, after a lot of trial and error and back and forth, you know, we were pretty happy with this two pounds per barrel dry hopped IPA getting 20 barrels with a 20 barrel batch. Yep. Uh, what do you use for foam control? For flow control? Foam control. Oh, foam control. Yeah. Um, so we use Burko, right? Uh, oh, Paco, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ber Berko, Paco, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's a uh, Paco and a foam. So, so it's it's not a like cymethicone based product actually, which means it's easy to clean and work with. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I, firm cap's pretty pretty common as well too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Very, very common use for that application. What would you say, like, I don't know if say it's any different, but what would you say, like, your best two or three best practices? Out of all those things? Out of all those things? 
Um, well, I think I mentioned the mill gap definitely is mm -hmm. like get that exactly where you need it to be um, and then keep that in control. Um, you know, I think when we started using the antifoam, we saw a pretty good improvement there because we were sort of struggling with like, it seems like we should be able to get more out of these. What's going on? So again, like, you know, and I could understand folks being like, I don't want to add anything new to my process. I, I could understand that as well, too. But, you know, just a little bit will go a long way there. Um, and the rest were all like all little ones. They were probably all, you know an eight-way tie for, <laughs> for for number three. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like things like the boil strength, like that was not obvious to us. You know, um, that's like we um, had a little bit of a weaker boil, and all of a sudden our yields are going down. We couldn't connect those dots. It took a while to figure that out, and like boiler water treatment and that sort of thing. So that was definitely you know, a little bit eye-opening as well. How long is your boil? Just um, it, it varies, so I'd probably say like... We, yeah, yeah, typically probably 60 on average, but we might do some that are as low as maybe, you know, 30 to 45, and we might do others that are 90 or even longer. But for a hay burner, it's probably, I think it's probably around 60. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you, I just I think I heard you mention earlier that the more often you drop, like, the tank bottom, the better you will be. <laughs> um, let's see here, where was that? So that's like, well, to tell you the truth, like we've tried it different ways and we haven't seen like a much, much better improvement in yield by dropping them more. But what we did see is that um, you want those, like you, you want to give it a day after it, it, it hits your, your cold crash temperature. So if it's going to go for more than a day, I've heard it both ways. We didn't see much of an improvement by like, let's say it's sitting in that tank for four days or something like that. You're dumping a little bit off every day. We didn't see like a huge improvement in yields by like dumping it off every day versus just leaving it. Um, so I can't say conclusively that that helps, but I, you know, I've sort of heard it both ways. Yeah, I, I guess um, I, we've got different velocities at my brewery and some of us are Kind of in the camp where right, let, let the thick stuff go, and once it once it gets a little bit thinner, just, just stop and wait, like waiting. Whereas other people are, uh, <laughs> it's still super super cloudy, you know, and super, you know, like let it let it run. I think one th one thing you could probably try would be, and I think this works best for us, is probably get that thick stuff off after 24 hours, and then before you go to transfer, like. You know, try to get all the beer out that you can't really use. You know, get it, get it to a point where it's like, I mean, you, you don't want to, you don't want to get too good beer. It should be a little bit better than that, right? But, um, you know, you don't, you don't need to, um, you don't want to keep all the bad stuff either. So, I mean, it's definitely a, a little bit of a balance. You can figure out where your racking stops. Yep, 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 absolutely. So ideally that racking arm is like all the way down and then at that point you're getting, you know, good beer. Other questions? How did you measure your volumes in the break tank? Um, we have a site class. Okay, and that, you had that before you started the project? Yes, okay. yes. Um, things we added during this, I think, I mean, that flow meter we added to our lauder process definitely during this analysis, we were sort of like we needed to know what that was to control it real well. I think everything else we already had. Uh, do you use a portable flow meter to measure the, uh, the volume from fermentation to grip? Uh, yes, you can do that too. We actually, if, like, let's say we've had days where, like, oh, the site glass is like leaking or something like that. You know, that's another good backup to do. Um, but like, if you've got it, like and another trick is getting your instruments calibrated. I didn't touch about that, to touch on that too much. But calibrating your bright tank is challenging. I mean, a lot of times we've had to do them two or three times. Uh, once you get it right, it's good. But if, you know, the important thing is you've got a calibrated instrument and like, um, but if your bright tank's calibrated and you got a sight glass, that'll work. If you don't, then a portable flow meter, as long as that's calibrated, will work just as well. As far as like process control, um, like 
putting the block and bleed in place and then pushing all your wort through your heat exchanger with water into the fermenter, getting more yield that way, yep. stuff like that. Yep, yep, no, that's definitely a good process. Um, I, well, we, we, we've never actually implemented that, but you know, I've, I know of other brewers doing that, so that will help probably recover a little bit extra and you know, a little less you're, you're not leaving behind, so yeah. that, definitely something good to try. That's the trick, right? But I mean, just like anything else, if you can sort of perfect that process, it should, should help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. work. Hmm? I missed this thought. Well, well, you made it water over time. Well, is the total amount of water that was entered into the system and started going to the back, was that constant? And the same question for the amount of rain. Was well, that constant too? No, I'd say we definitely, you know, we did increase the amount of grain and probably the amount of the actual total amount of dry hops that we put in the, the system. So, um, so, I mean, so, and with that, also more water. So we were using more ingredients, you know, but we were making some of those ingredients more efficient again. So like by getting the amount of crash time exactly right, same amount of hops maybe, but we were getting more beer out of that. So, so that worked. Um, so again, some of these things would directly impact your cost of goods just because yield, other things they wouldn't because we were using more ingredients, but overall um, certainly improved our efficiency. I mean, our costs certainly came down through this process. Yep. You explored in the uh, concentrated hot pot we have we have played with that before. We didn't for this beer just because of the some of the nature of some of the ingredients. Um, like some of the hops we use aren't available in that method. But you know, we we've used them in other products, and there's definitely benefits to be had. I mean, the you know a lot of this is about um, separating out your beer from your hops or your wort from your hops. So the less green matter you're putting into your process, probably the better yield you're going to get. So um, you know, there's definitely efficiencies you can you can use there. Again, this isn't really focused on that. It wasn't really about changing your recipe too, too much. But um, there's definitely products out there that can help with that too. But it, it, it depends on what, you know, what those products are and how much they cost and how much you're using. You know, it might be different for every sort of recipe. Yep, yep. Anything else? Good. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you.